Welcome back. I'm going to work on this section of fruit next. Again, I'm sticking to the same order as I did in the underpainting. But before I begin, I want to clear all of this excess paint off my palette to keep it from looking confusing and to avoid picking up chunks of dried paint with my brush when I use it to mix colors on my palette. Okay, great. Let's begin. I'll start mixing a light color for the left hand side of the orange slice. It's light and muted because what we're seeing isn't actually the fruit. It's mostly the rind that stuck to the side of the wedge when it was peeled. So I'm mixing a value using almost equal amounts of paint from the first and second piles of both the gray and orange scales. This shape is so light it's almost pure first value. By the time I'm on my final coat, I want these two areas on the orange slice to glow. I want them to feel like they have light shining through them, making that orange color one of the most vibrant and gratifying areas on the painting to look at. It's going to take some work, but I will show you how to create that effect. Which brings us to some more color theory. In order to have that orange color look bright and vibrant, it has to have values around it that aren't bright and vibrant. Let me explain what I mean by that. Remember, all values are relative. Well, all colors are relative too. And in order for this color to look bright and backlit, it needs to be next to some colors and values that are dimmer and less chromatic. Here's what I mean. Let's take our balloon, for example. That orange looks pretty bright until I make the background an even more chromatic orange. Then our balloon looks gray and muted. What we want to do on our grapefruit is the opposite of that. I want to mute the orange around it so that when I paint that bright full chroma orange on later, it looks even brighter to our eye because we have a contrasting lower chroma color all around it. And the more muted I make the color around my orange, the more vibrant and brighter it will appear, eventually making it look like there's a light shining through it. So when you mute your colors around the color you want to push, you'll start to get some more dynamic and exciting color schemes in your paintings. But I'm getting ahead of myself. You'll see the entire process I use to create this effect as we progress in the lesson. I'll move down to the peel next. I'm picking up a little second or third value, muting it a bit and painting in the outline first. The most important shape should have already been identified and defined in the underpainting. So all you have to do is apply color on top of what's there. Don't worry about detail or any subtleties yet. Next, I'll move inward a step to the white part of the rind, but notice it's somewhere between first and second value orange around the edge and gets gradually whiter towards the inside. As you can see, I'm painting the edge first so that I can manage the line between the peel and the rind. Then I'm going to pick up some first value orange for the white part because if you look closely at the reference, you'll see it's actually off white and slightly warmed with a little yellow. 
Just the broad strokes. I know it seems sloppy at first, but it always does until you manage the edge or outline around an area you're filling in. Have you noticed that yet? I'll move down to this drop shadow across the bottom next. It's okay if it's a little darker for now. I just want to make sure I keep its shape separate from the darker shapes in the fruit so I don't lose my drawing. This plane down here isn't as simple as one solid line. Its edge is being created by the texture of the tear, which is big enough that I want to begin creating it in this coat. So I'm going to fill this shape in completely with first value orange, then come back with some second and third value orange to start adding the texture. Most of this area in here is closer to third or fourth value gray, so lean towards your grayscale to mix these colors. I know the video is a little sped up, but I'm staying zoomed in so you can see that every time I pick up paint with my detail brush for this part, I twirl the brush to mold it into a fine point so I can get a nice thin line application. I'm adding some orange to the gray a little bit at a time to try to get it to the right value and chroma simultaneously. I'll move up to the top left next. Notice that there's this dark gray sort of vein silhouetted in this sliver of rind that's sticking up. It's always surprising to me how much gray is actually in a painting, especially one as colorful as this one. I'll move to this main shape next. This is only the first color coat, so for now I'm just going to fill in the area using the darkest value I see, and using a quarter inch angular shader to just get the broad strokes in. I'm painting very thinly, so I need a few more drops of liquid medium. I'm using fifth value as a placeholder for the correct color because I want to prime this shape so it's prepared to have a vibrant color painted over it in the next coat. So for now, it's going to look like a washy medium brown since this is just a base coat. I am going to use increasingly lighter values as I go towards the top, but keep your paint thin and don't start adding any real information yet. 
I don't want you to be worried about covering your work over when you get to the next coat. It's going to take a few coats to get that beautiful orange color in the photo, so you have to be patient. Next, I'm going to pick up some first value and put in some of the bright rim lights along the top of the section. As you can see, I'm using 4th value gray and my detail brush to define these smaller shapes. Give that area two minutes to dry, then go back and paint in some of the lighter shapes and details. Define them as much as you want without letting it become tedious to you. Remember to take your time and enjoy the process. If painting is feeling tedious to you, it means you're either doing something incorrectly or you've been working for too long and should take a break. I'll pick up some fourth value to bring the background in around this shape. Great, this is close enough. Don't worry about softening any of those shapes or doing any blending yet. This is a good first color coat on something this complex. Remember, this is all just preparation for the next glaze. Let that dry and let's move on to the final section of fruit. 